Uh, what I want you to do this morning is I want you to turn in your Bible to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I, I want you to just sort of go to that area, uh, especially if you find them while I'm sort of giving the preliminaries this morning. If you find them, go to where in each book Christ died on the cross, okay? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It'll be Luke 23, I know that. It'll be uh, Matthew 26, I believe. Uh, it'll be Mark 14, possibly. It'll be Luke 19, I think. Just guessing. Just giving you something to shoot for. Uh, and, and while you're doing that, while you're looking for those places, I'm going to kind of build up to that. But those, that's where I'm going to end up, all right? The verses that I have before that, I'm going to move through them real fast and just kind of show you a pattern that God has set forth. I like patterns. I like, in my Bible, I like seeing that things are in line, things are in order. God does everything in order. God, God's word is in order. He says and uh, tells us as church members, let all things be done decently in order. And I believe God's a God of order. I believe if you were to go out tonight and look at the stars and measure each one and figure out where each one is, go to this, this exact same day next year and look up, you will find the exact same stars even though they move around. God is a God of order. And while I'm saying this, um, there'll be no uh, afternoon service today and then Wednesday night uh, I'm going to take a little time and kind of recharge my batteries there's a camp meeting going on down in Harrison Arkansas brother Mike Hutzel is a pastor down there and uh, brother Lonnie Burks is going to be preaching this Wednesday night I'd like to go down and hear brother Lonnie have not preached in a long time and so Lisa and I will be headed down uh, this Wednesday and um, I will send out the link since Brother Mike is the pastor there, um, I will be sending out the link to their streaming service. I know they stream, and uh, I'm not sure what uh, platform they use. But once I find it out, I'll send it out on Twitter. It'll show up on Twitter. It'll show up on Facebook, my Facebook page. It will show up in the Bethel Church Group Facebook page. And then uh, we also are on Parler, P A. R-L-E-R, -E uh, which is sort of a platform that rose up after Twitter started kicking off all the conservatives, including the President of the United States. That's a joke. That was serious <laughs> censorship. Just because they didn't like what he said, and just because they wanted to cover up for the other side of the political scheme that kicked the President off. So we're on Parler. Uh, we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook twice, and then if you go, just go to our church website, BethelChurchMo.com, all the Twitter feeds and announcements show up there. So I'll be uh, releasing that as soon as I find it out this Wednesday. So this Wednesday, we'll be in service down there, Thursday night, they'll be preaching, Friday there's preaching, Saturday morning I'll be preaching down there, I think from like 1030 on. And uh, so pray for me that God will, I still don't know, I'm not settled yet on what to preach yet. So pray for me on that. All right, you're in the Gospels. I'm in Luke chapter 4, verse 1. I want you to pay attention to what I read. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a soul sin through ignorance, think about what he's saying. What he's saying is, just because you may not know everything or every rule that God has, or just because you are not aware that something you did was a sin, God is still going to hold you accountable to it. In this country, ignorance of the law is not a valid defense. You cannot say, well, I didn't know there was anything illegal in this. Try that with the IRS. They're waiting for you to show up. I didn't know what I was doing was wrong. Ignorance of the law is no defense, and it's the same way with God. Just because you're living a certain lifestyle, and in your mind, you think that what you're doing is okay, 
you might want to check the Bible. Because now God did allow a sacrifice to be made for ignorance. But if you don't know something and you still commit the act, you are still accountable for that act. Keep that in your mind. Next time you decide when I get to heaven, I'll just say, God, I didn't know that was wrong. God's going to say, you know what? My Holy Spirit tried to tell you while you were doing it that it was wrong and you knew it was wrong. So he said, speak unto the children of Israel, saying, if a soul sin through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which ought not to be done and shall do against any of them. If the priest that is anointed do sin according to the sin of the people, then let them bring for his sin, which he has sinned, a young bullock without blemish unto the Lord for a sin offering. And he shall bring the bullock under the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. And he shall lay his hand upon the bullock's head and kill the bullock before the Lord and the priest that is anointed shall take of the bullock's blood. There's not going to be a test on this. Don't worry. But shall take of the bullock's blood and bring it to the tabernacle of the congregation. And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle of the blood seven times before the Lord, before the veil of the sanctuary. Seven times. Why did he use that number? On the day of atonement, they were to take the lamb's blood, take hyssop, Dip it in the lamb's blood. Go into the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They were to sprinkle that blood with the hyssop exactly seven times. If they did it five times, God would probably kill the priest. If they did it eight, nine, ten times and the priest just in there drunk, he doesn't know what he's doing, God will probably kill the priest. He said exactly Seven times. And if God said seven times, he meant seven times. Uh, Joshua. When Israelites marched around Jericho on the seventh day, it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day and could pass the city after the same manner seven times. They marched for six days, one time a day only. One time only for six days. Now they're on the seventh day. Only on that day, they can pass the city seven times. God told them exactly seven times. Do you think they lost count? Not a chance. They did exactly, even if they didn't understand what God told them to do, they did what God told them to do regardless. If God said seven times, then we're going to do this thing seven times. And then it came to pass on the seventh time when the priest blew with the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city, and the city shall be accursed, even it, and all that are therein to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. So we have back here, God says do this seven times. We have here around Jericho, they said seven times. They did it exactly seven times. In Second Kings, we have a man by the name of Naaman. Naaman's problem is what? Who remembers? He is a leper. He has leprosy. His skin is full of leprosy. And he is a great man. And he knows he's going to die of leprosy. And to him, he does not want to die that way. So he goes to Elisha, the prophet. And he says, send word to Elisha. And he thought maybe Elisha would come out and make some big ceremony out of it. And he had all these presents for Elisha. And Elisha doesn't even come out of the tent. He tells Gehazi, his servant, you go tell him what I said. And here's Naaman with all these presents to give. And here's the man of God saying, what I'm going to give you is by grace and not by the things that you turn over to me. You understand that part of it. If you don't understand anything else I preach today, that if you want God to save you, don't you dare bring in presents, gifts, money, real estate. Don't turn it over to the church. Don't think that because you gave money in the offering plate that that's going to save you. God says, take your gifts and eat them. I don't care what I do for you. I do because I love you and it's by grace and nothing else. Somebody say amen. So 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 9, So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash it in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth and went away and said, Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and make a big deal of this. 
and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place. And, re- you know, like they do on TV, got to make a big scene out of healing somebody. Did you know that God could heal you without some big guy on TV going? Rrr, rrr, rrr. And he said, are not Avana and far par rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather than when he said to thee, wash and be clean. And you see, there's simplicity in God's grace, is there not? Then he went down, dipped himself seven times in Jordan. Not six, not eight, not 15. Well, that's seven, but I'm going to do another seven more just in case. He did seven. According to the saying of the Son of Man, his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean seven times. Daniel. You can turn to Daniel if you want. Daniel chapter 9. Let me show you something very quickly out of here. Daniel chapter 9. This is all leading up to a point. Daniel chapter 9. There is a prophecy that is yet for an appointed time for the people of Israel. Do not give up on the Jews. God has a time and a place and a salvation reserved for the children of Israel. You and I are just nothing but Gentiles. God has a place reserved for the children of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, through the tribes, uh, 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 Judah and Gath and Naphtali and Issachar and Simeon and Levi. God has a salvation appointed unto them. And here's what he said. Daniel chapter 9. Verse 24, 70 weeks. How many, how long? That's a multiple seven, isn't it? Imagine that. That's 490 days. Now, I want you to remember that number, 490. I want you to remember that number, 490. Write it down on a piece of paper if you have to. If you can't remember between now and three minutes from now, like I can't, write down 490. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Number one, to finish the transgression. Number two, to make an end of sins. Number three, to make reconciliation for iniquity. Number four, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Number five, to seal up the vision. Number six, and the prophecy. And number seven, to anoint the most holy. You know who the most holy is? It's Christ. The word anoint means Mashiach, anointed one, Christ. And I want you to notice He says exactly seven things are going to happen in 70 weeks. That's 490 days, 70 times seven. And notice what he says. Notice the first thing out of his mouth, to finish the transgression. If God forgives, if God says, I'm going to forgive your sin. And then a year, two years later, 10 years later down the road, you commit the same sin again. Is God going to say, whoops, you shouldn't have done that. I'm going to unforgive what you did 10 years ago, and I'm going to lay that back on top of you. Is God going to do that? If God says he's going to finish the transgression, does that mean that forever it's gone? Yes. Hallelujah is right. How many times does God have to forgive you for the same sin? How many times, since we talked about this in Sunday school, how many times does Christ have to die for the sins of all mankind? Chris, one time. Chris said he was one of them altar boys who used to wash them priest's hands. You're lucky that's all they did. To make an end of sins. If God says, I'm going to make you stop sinning. First of all, how many of you are going to go, Hallelujah, I'm not going to sin no more. That'd be me. To make reconciliation for iniquity. That means it was between you and God and now it's not between you and God anymore. He's not going to hold you accountable for it ever again. That means the law is not still out looking for you. Amen. And to bring in, how long does his righteousness last? Everlasting. 
Never stops to seal up the vision and prophecy and anoint the most holy. Now notice that. He's, seven things he said. Now all have to do with forgiveness of sins. And he said he was going to do it 490 days. 70 weeks. 70 times 7. Wait a minute. Hold on a second. That, that, that uh, equation, 70 times 7. Does that sound familiar to somebody? Is that somewhere in the Bible? Well, lo and behold, Matthew chapter 18. Turn there. Since you're turning in Matthew 18. Matthew anyway. Matthew 18 verse 21. Then came Peter unto him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Now, I want, it, I want all God's people pay attention to this. I want everybody that ain't God's people listen to it. Trust me, even if you're not saved and don't have any, you never want to be a Christian all your life. If you'll do this, I promise you, you'll have a better life. If somebody offends you, is it A, better to hold a grudge for the next 40 years and hate their guts, or B, get over it and forgive them? Which is better, A or B? B. Even if you're not ever, you don't plan on being a Christian forever. You don't care nothing about religion, God, Jesus, preachers like me. You just happen to be listening. It's Easter. Your wife said, sit down and listen to this. I'm telling you, if you will, somebody, whoever offends you, if you will just not carry the grudge for the next 50 years and just let it go, you're going to be a much happier person. Peter came to him, Lord, how often shall my... What, what, what if he keeps doing it? Let's keep forgiving him. I, I learned that lesson when Lindsay was born. And I found out that my wife was going to make me change diapers too. Like it's your turn. What? You're changing the diaper. I ain't change the diaper. So I changed the diaper and I forgave her sins. Because lo and behold, she did it again. Right? And then lo and behold, she did it again. One time, it was seven times in one day. <laughs> Thank God it wasn't 490 times in one day. How oft shall I, my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Until seven times, Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. That is the exact same formula that he used here in Daniel 9 when he said... And by the way, this is not just to the Israelites. This is to everybody who becomes an Israelite through trusting in Christ. God, when he says, I forgave your sins, he forgave it forever. Forever. And he's never going to bring it back up on you ever again. Thank God is right. So... Does it surprise you? The, the, the work of God to forgive our sins is why we're here today. It's the cross. Jesus dying one time on the cross. So does it surprise you to find out that Jesus spoke exactly seven times from the cross? Exactly seven times. After all, he's the word of God, is he not? We learned in Sunday school what crucifixion is. It's an eight hour long strangulation. If it be like Jim, if it be like if somebody held their hands over your throat, over your windpipe, and put in just enough pressure for you to squeeze in and out the minuscule amount of air to keep you alive. And they held you there for eight hours. Mm -hmm. 
When you think about, when we have communion and we think we're going to commemorate the Lord's death, and, or when you think about the cross and what Christ did for you, I want you to understand that Christ strangled between the sixth hour, no, the, the third hour of the day, the ninth hour of the day, I believe is what it was. Somebody check me out on that. All from the morning, they had to get him down before dark. And he died just before sunset. That means he strangled all day long. Did he suffer? And it, and it brings a tear in my eye every time I think about it. That he did that, but it was my fault that he did it. When our soldiers went running up on Omaha Beach, Utah Beach, Gold Beach, Juneau Beach, that's where the British were. Even though the Germans were still there, the French people came out and met them with bottles of champagne and kisses and hugs. Do you know why? Because they recognized that 3,000 of our men had just spilled their blood so those Frenchmen could be free from Germany. And they gave our boys a hero's welcome in every town they went into. Jesus is going to get his one of these days from us. Amen? But does it, does it not surprise you that Jesus said seven things from the cross? I'm going to run through these. Here's what he said. First thing he said, Luke 23. First thing he said, Luke 23, 33. Open your Bibles up, follow along with me. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand, the other on the left, then said Jesus. First thing out of Jesus' mouth on the cross. Watch, look at this. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Matthew, it would be like if somebody killed your wife and family. And they're fixing to give him the death penalty. And they ask for you to stand in court. And you stand in court and say, Father, forgive him. I'm not sure I could do that. Someone killed my wife and children and grandchildren. I'm not sure I could stand up in court and say, Father, forgive him. But Jesus sure did us. Father forgives. First thing he said, Father forgive them for they know not what they do and they parted his raiment and cast lots. Romans 4, 7. Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Ephesians 1, 7. And then we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Do you not understand that the first thing Jesus said out of his mouth was so that you know what the cross is about? It's, Father, forgive them. <laughs> Again, you can respond to that however you want to respond to it. You can respond to it in your spirit. I'm not looking for an amen. I'm not looking for you to get up and dance. I just want you to know what was done for you and what was said on your behalf. Second thing, Luke 23. One of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. That guy's in hell right now, by the way. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. That man said, I deserve to be on a cross. I'm a thief. They hang thieves. They're watching me strangle and die. They're going, I'm going to spend all day dying on this cross. I deserve to be here. 
But this man has done nothing amiss. How did that thief know that? Jesus didn't spend time in the clink with him, did he? Jesus didn't spend time in jail talking to him. Jesus going, I don't deserve to be here. That's what everybody in prison says. How did this, how did this man know that Jesus didn't deserve to be on the cross? The Holy Ghost told him. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. That's heaven. Romans 10. <coughs> this, is my fav this is my favorite explanation of Romans 10. Romans 10 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. First thing out of the thief's mouth is, Lord. He knows who Jesus is, doesn't he? He knows who he is. He's the sinless son of God hanging on a cross. He knows it. Lord, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in that heart that God raised him from the dead. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He knows that Jesus is going to die, but he also knows that he's going to rise from the dead and have a king. He's going to be the king of kings and lord of lords. He knows it. He's saved. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in the heart, God shall raise him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. The worst dream that I ever have is the dream where I'm out with no clothes on. I hate that dream. And understand that when they hung Jesus... And more than likely, when they hung everybody else up on a cross, they stripped every stitch of clothing off of them. So that not only do they have to be strangled for hours on end, they have to be exposed and ashamed in front, while everybody looks upon them and mocks them. And the first thing that God ever did with you to confront you about your sin was make you ashamed of what you did. Somebody say amen. Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. So they took all of Jesus' clothes off and hung him in front of everybody so that you wouldn't have to go through that. Third thing, John 19. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and disciples standing by him, whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, you will never ever find in the Bible where Jesus called Mary mother. Never. Never. It's not in there. He never, ever, one time, not even from the cross did he say, Mother. So that's why I get really bent out of shape. When they call Mary Mother of God, number one, God didn't have a mother. And number two, that Jesus, upon speaking to Mary from the cross gave her the same experience that he was having on the cross. Therefore, Mary is as much our Redeemer as Jesus is. I get angry at that. He never called her mother. He called her woman. Woman. Behold thy son. You know what Mary said when she found out that she was going to give birth to Jesus? 
She said, I rejoice in the Lord, my Savior. That's because Mary knew that she was a sinner. Needed a Savior. So here's Jesus, who knows she prayed that prayer, saying to her on the cross, Woman, behold thy son. I'll die for you too. Then he says to the disciple, he's talking about John, because Jesus gave custody of Mary to John. John, take care of my mother. Behold thy mother. He says it to John. Why does he say that? From that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. Galatians 4 tells us why. Mary is a representative. She's a type. She's a figure. She's a foreshadow. She is a caricature of what is our mother, which is Jerusalem above. Paul said in Galatians 4.20, verse, in fact, let me read verse 21. Tell me ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise, for which things are an allegory. For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. And I forgot to put the rest of the verse in there. But then it says, but uh, he from Jerusalem above, which is free, which is the mother of us all. You see what it takes to be born again. Be me being born of St. Judy. That's what I call her. When I say, Mom, pray for me. She says, Son, I pray for you. So I call her St. Judy. Me being born from her, all it did was make me the same kind of sinner as her. But I've been born again, which means not only do I have a new father, which is God above, I've got a new mother, which is not Mary. And it's not this church. It is Jerusalem in heaven, which is free. Somebody say amen. It's like Paul telling him they were going to arrest him and kill him. And Paul said, are you going to arrest and kill a Roman citizen? The Roman soldier said, Roman citizen, I paid a lot of money to become a Roman citizen. How did you get to be a Roman citizen? Paul said, I was born one. How did you get to be a citizen from heaven? Paul said, we have no care. We have no continuing city, which means we have no continuing country. We have no continuing life. And I have no continuing body. But up there, it continues forever. Somebody say amen. Fourth thing Jesus said, Matthew 27, verse 45. And now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. Yep, I was right. From the third hour of the day, nine o'clock in the morning, to the ninth hour, about six o'clock in the evening. That's how long he hung on that cross. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Now, you would think that the people down at the cross who heard that language would have known that language, but they didn't. Because had they known it, Gary, they would have known, he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And they would have referenced, turn to Psalm 22. Turn to Psalm 22. Everybody turn to Psalm 22. Underline these verses. Psalm 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You know what they said? You know what those people who knew that language said? He's calling for Elijah. They had no clue. You know why? God blinded them. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Psalm 22, 8. Let him deliver, seeing he delighted him. That's what they said. If, he, if you be the Christ... Come down, let God deliver you. God will send angels down and deliver you. Psalm twenty-two sixteen, they pierce my hands and feet. Psalm twenty-two eighteen, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Here's one thing I get out of this. Jesus 
is fulfilling a scripture that is a thousand years old. They not only, David not only wrote down the exact words that Jesus would say, he wrote down the at least three events that he was told by the Holy Spirit that would happen on the day that Christ was crucified. If you don't believe that the crucifixion of Christ, number one, is a historical account, you're wrong. Number two, if you don't believe that the crucifixion of Christ was a prophetic account, I can show you proof that a thousand years ago they wrote down the words that he said and the things they did to him. He fulfills prophecy. Number five, John chapter 19. After this, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. By the way, what did, when he said, I thirst, what did they give him to drink? Did they give him uh, Kool-Aid, Gatorade, Pepsi, Coke, Mountain Dew? What did they give him? Vinegar. Mingled with gall. It's supposed to be like an anesthetic. And the Bible says it touched his lips. And by the way, vinegar is what? Sweet or? You know what the Bible says? That Jesus tasted death for every man. If you've ever drank wormwood gall or vinegar it's bitter and if you've ever been through death it's bitter too isn't it when your mama died or your daddy died Or your child died. Or your granddaughter died. Or your wife died. Or your husband died. It's bitter, isn't it? Jesus tasted it. So he knows what it's like. Not just the vinegar that he tasted. He lost his best friend Lazarus. And he himself died. The Bible calls him the firstborn of the dead, which means... He went before us to show us that he's not the kind of God that just sits up on a throne and lets us do all the suffering. He's the kind of God that comes down here and suffers worse than we've ever suffered. Sixth thing he said... <clears throat> Luke 23, 46, when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Here again, he's quoting prophecy. For that's in Psalm 31, verse 4. Pull me out of the net that they have laid privily for me, for thou art my strength. By the way, every one of you are sinners. Do you know why? The devil made sure of it. He, laid, he cast a net for you to fall into. I want everybody, just for a minute, I'm almost done. I want everybody for a minute to think about the worst sin issue that you ever had to go through in your life. It was a sin issue. You may have got caught or you, it, it may have had some sort of devastating, horrible effect on you or your life. And you wished then that you had never 
done that. Do you know why that happened? It says right here, the devil laid a trap for you. To catch you in it. Knowing how easy it would probably be to catch you. And you fell right into it. But then, pull me out of the net that they have laid privily for me, for thou art my strength. Into thine hand I commit my spirit. Now does it make sense? The devil, in case you don't understand, the devil already has destroyed your body with sin. He's already caught your flesh in so many sins, you will never get out of it. But Jesus didn't say, Into thy hands, Father, I commit my body. That's not what he said, is it? Into thy hands, I commend my spirit. I have hated them that regard lying vanities, but I trust in the Lord. That's why you got saved to begin with. Seventh thing, and I'm done. Notice, notice the seventh thing thing that he said when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar he said it is finished now let me dovetail that with what I taught in Sunday school and what I've been teaching the watchman broadcast I have now to as of today so one two three four five six six videos I believe on the Eucharist Dealing with various aspects of what the priest tells everybody versus what the Bible says. And if you're a Roman Catholic or you're of anything like that, I read off a list of people who believe similar to that. And there's a bunch of them, so I'm not just picking on Catholics. You never, ever, ever have any assurance that you're going to heaven the whole time. You go to the Catholic Church. No priest has ever told you, if you receive this today, ye shall never die. You are guaranteed a place in heaven. They never tell you that because they don't believe it. So they've set up all of these sacraments, sacraments of penance, sacrament of the Eucharist, the holy orders, different things, sacrament of baptism. When my mom... Years ago, we used to have a daycare center. My mom was a director. There was a, a couple of, a set of twin girls, five years old, beautiful girls. They had an older brother. He was about 11 years old. They lived out on CC Highway. Dad had some farmland out there. He had pulled over a bunch of stumps, and the stumps were laying over sideways like this with the root wad hanging out. And one of the twin girls and the 11-year-old boy were next to that root wad play in there and that root wad fell over and killed both of those children the mother was catholic that priest from sacred heart church over here went to that grieving mother and said your five-year-old daughter is in hell and she'll never get out because she wasn't baptized That mom was already about to kill herself anyway. That's wicked. Don't ask me to be nice about this issue because I won't. Because I know what those rascals do. And I know the amount of money they extort out of widows to get people out of purgatory. They will never tell you that you can be forgiven of all of your sins for all of eternity. They will keep you under their thumb. Always guilty. Always guilty. Always guilty. And yet Christ said, it is finished. It's done. Your sins have been forgiven. Never to be laid upon your 
account again. When you die, they will look at you and they will open your books. And because the blood has washed and covered the sins, they will say, I find no fault in him. Somebody say amen. Woo! It's finished. Now you can live either without a religion, constantly having your sins eat at you, the stuff you did that nobody knows about, the stuff that you did that you're scared to death is going to come back on you. You're running and nobody's chasing you. But I will say, be sure your sin will find you out. Last week, we found out a free will Baptist preacher and his wife were having a love triangle with another man and while the Free Will Baptist preacher was on a mission trip, being holy, his wife and the other man arranged to have that man murdered. And when he came back and was asleep in bed, the other man came in the house, blew his brains out. Guess what? Everybody now found out about his sin, didn't they? And who do you think arranged all of that? God did. You can either live your life scared to death that everybody's going to find out what you've really been doing. Or you can be in a religion where they will tell you you can never know whether you're going to heaven. Or you can believe three words. It is finished. It's up to you. Would you stand to your feet?